the Great Plains. Stretching from the broad Texas panhandle up through the mountain reaches of Montana to the Canadian border. A country of high winds and sun. And a country of so much more. Before European colonization, the plains supported between 30 and 60 million bison as well as pronghorn, deer and elk, wolves, bears, an array of grassland birds, and black-footed ferrets. Some even call it the American Serengeti. But by the late 1880s, only a few hundred bison remained. Due to market hunting and a government effort to wipe out the bison to subdue the native people who depended on them. And with westward expansion and the Homestead Act came the plow. Settler, plow at your peril. And plow we did. Today, more than 70% of America's tall grassland, mixed grass, and short grass prairies have vanished. In fact, grasslands are the most threatened ecosystem on the planet. And yet, despite threats of conversion to cropland and development, portions of the prairie remain intact and tribes, landowners, agencies, and conservation groups are working together to steward our grasslands and support the species and people that call this place home. It's just the ecosystem should be whole. Like the way we're, we're brought up as native people plays a big role in our conservation. Many people today think of the plains as flyover country, suggesting there's really nothing going on out on the prairie. But if you stand still and pay attention, you'll find that there's an entire world out there, and most of it's right under your feet. But it also helps to spend a little time with the locals. There's so much that goes on. There's so many species of wildlife, and most people are oblivious to it. it they have no idea. There's this whole world out there that I relate it to almost like the deep ocean. There's so much more going on out here. I'm Hallie Mahold. And I'm Jared Beaver. And today on Working Wild U, we're honing in on one species that calls the Great Plains home. A small predator that was thought to be extinct, not once, but twice. The black-footed ferret, the most endangered mammal in North America that's starting to make a comeback thanks to help from communities on the ground. From ranchers on the high plains of eastern Colorado to the Fort Belknap Indian community in northern Montana. But how did we get here? Stick around and find out after the break. Working Wild U is a proud part of Natural Resources University, a podcast network delivering science-based information for your natural resource management. Other current network series include Timber University, Fish University, Deer University, Fire University, and Habitat University. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Buckle up, because today's story requires a little time travel. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, black-footed ferrets once numbered in the tens of thousands. But by the 1960s, the ferrets had dwindled to just one known population in South Dakota. Biologists captured some of the ferrets to start a captive breeding program to try to save the species. But that breeding program failed, and the holdout population in South Dakota died out. The black-footed ferret was declared extinct. Now let's fast forward a bit to the fall of 1981, 3 a.m. on a ranch near Matitsi, Wyoming. A now famous ranch dog named Shep was barking outside the house with, well, an unusual quarry. Here's John Hogg, rancher and Shep's owner. Well, when I stepped out there and looked, it was laying there on the ground. And I looked at it pretty soon, I picked it up and brought it in showed it to Lucille and the kids and said, look what the dog brought in. They didn't know what it was either. Lucille says, well, let's take that, that down and have it mounted. I had it in a gunny sack and dumped it out on the floor. Oh, he said, oh my God, you got a, a black-footed ferret there. I said, black-footed ferret, what's that? Wow, well, that is quite a story from the late John Hogg. And an important question at the end. Jared, what are we talking about here? Black-footed ferrets, the only ferret native to the Americas. Think 
little bandit weasel-like critters. Tan fur, black mask around their eyes, and their long slender bodies are perfectly designed for moving fast underground. And their entire livelihood depends on prairie dogs. It's all they eat. And they even use their burrows to make their homes and raise their young. But have you seen them in size compared to the prairie dogs? I mean, prairie dogs are like these chunky, fat little things, and then the ferrets are long and skinny. I mean, their hips are as skinny as their necks, and oh, it's just, well, it's kind of hard to imagine ferrets eating prairie dogs. Yeah, one ferret can eat about 100 prairie dogs a year. But, you know, you give them that little black mass, they're really like the Zorro of the plains. Back to Wyoming in the late 1980s. After discovering they were looking at a ferret, the taxidermist called wildlife officials, who the Hogg family welcomed out onto the ranch to conduct surveys in search of more ferrets. And they found them, a population of over 100 black-footed ferrets, a species thought to have been extinct for nearly 20 years. This was a big deal. That is a big deal. And it'd take a lot of prairie dogs to feed a community that size. And Jonathan Wrights, biologist at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, tells us what happened next. By the way, Jonathan oversees ferret recovery in Colorado. We'll hear more from him later on. And then just a, a few years later, Silvatic Plague hit that, that population. And, and they, they had estimated about 129 ferrets. And before they knew it, they were down to somewhere around 20. And they had been contemplating for a while, should we be taking any of these ferrets back into captivity? Should we start a breeding program? Well, all of a sudden when the, the population totally collapsed, they realized they needed to do something. You heard that right, the plague. The same bacterium that led to the Black Plague in 14th century Europe that killed over a third of the European population. Plague is non-native to the Americas and ferrets and prairie dogs have no natural defense. And so there was a lot of fear that they would capture these last ferrets and actually be the nail in the coffin and cause the, the total demise of the ferrets. But instead, they were able to pioneer the methods to be able to bring the, the ferret back. So scientists captured these remaining ferrets on the ranch, and they became the foundation for a successful captive breeding and reintroduction program that continues today. But to be clear, we're not out of the woods yet. There are only about 30 reintroduction sites in the country, and there are fewer than 400 black-footed ferrets in the wild. We're still in the early chapters of bringing this species back from the brink. And while about half of the West is public land, 90% of the Great Plains are privately owned. Private landowners are key to this black-footed ferret recovery. And one of those landowners is Dallas May, a rancher I've had a pleasure of getting to know well over the years in southeast Colorado. Working Wild U producer Zach Altman met with the Mays out on their ranch. I'm Dallas May. I've had the privilege of being here my whole life. My, my dad, Raymond, my mom, Irene, my brother, Bon, my sister, Deb, our kids live on the ranch. Our grandchildren live on the ranch. Uh, we're a working cattle ranch. We, we raise registered limousine cattle, sell seed stock. We are fifth generation on the ground. That's Riley May, son of Dallas. But it's not a typical ranch as far as a fourth and fifth generation goes. We have been on this ranch for over 40 years, but we didn't own it. We leased the ranch for the first 30 years and always hoped that we would have the opportunity someday to own it. Um, it was really difficult, but in 2012, the owners of the ranch came to us ready to sell, gave us the opportunity. So we had to leverage everything we could. We got financed, we bought the ranch in 2012. So that gave us the freedom at that point to begin to implement some of these strategies that we have in the last few years with working with different conservation groups. As soon as we were able to, we put a conservation easement on the ranch in order to keep it as it is. But the May shared that in order to do all of this conservation work, they've got to keep the business afloat. We'll still be making our land payments and things are really tough. <clears throat> we have to work and make things economic to pay our bills and it has to be a profitable working land to even support the wildlife. Because if we can't make our payments, somebody else will have the ability to manage the land and who knows what would happen with it. 
We're hearing a lot of core values coming from Dallas and Raleigh. Maintaining open space, supporting wildlife, staying economically viable. Our aim is biodiversity. We want a complete chain of biodiversity. And the only way to get that is to do some sort of nature mimicry, which we try to do everything we can in the most natural way. It's hard to convey all that the Mays are doing both on and off the ranch as it connects to conservation. They sell carbon credits on the global market. Dallas serves on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission and is also on the board of Western Landowners Alliance. The Mays invite any and all conservation groups and academic research out onto their ranch. Recently, they even partnered with Denver Botanical Gardens to conduct a multi-year plant survey. They documented 335 different species of plants that are on the ranch. 85% of them are native plants. Basically, the part of the ranch that we're standing on, this is native plants, and the biodiversity is mostly intact. And this is especially significant when you consider the area around Lamar, Colorado, where the May family lives. There's just not a lot of prairie left. Oh, this habitat that we are on right now is kind of an island in the middle of all this farmland. And it's so important that we keep this intact and keep the natural biodiversity going so that all of these different things can keep supporting each other. And the May Ranch supports a variety of imperiled species, including the Arkansas darter, a small fish found only in the tributaries of the Arkansas River, the eastern black rail, an incredibly rare marsh bird, and more recently, black-footed ferrets. Up on our shorter grass, that's where we have released the black-footed ferrets. It took us 10 years of work. It's very difficult to be able to bring the ferrets in because, as you know, it's so critical, the small numbers they have. Um, have to make sure that the habitat is in place, that the prey dog colonies are stable, and everything is there so that once the ferrets are released, they have the maximum chance for survival. After a decade of work with partners, including Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the May Ranch was finally deemed ready to have black-footed ferrets released into their prairie dog colonies, one of only 30 release sites in the world. And actually the black-footed ferret reintroduction program, as far as landowners go, is nothing more than a prairie dog preservation program. A prairie dog preservation program? That complicates things. Ferrets rely exclusively on prairie dogs for their room and board, and prairie dogs and ranchers historically have a troubled relationship. If a landowner, for example, allows thousands of prairie dogs to thrive on their property, prairie dogs that, by the way, create holes that horses and cattle can break legs in and could potentially spread plague to other animals, this can really create some social challenges with their neighbors. That's right, Hallie. And even if you get past those issues, there's also the issue of potential forage competition. Because at the end of the day, prairie dogs are grazers as well. And right now, the May Ranch hosts about 1,500 acres of active prairie dog burrows. That means a lot of bare ground and grazed grass. And valuable forage that's no longer available for their cattle. And in the arid west, every acre of forage counts. But while it can seem like it's really a story about prairie dogs versus cattle or a straight black and white issue, it's clear the Mays see it as much more of a gray area. Here's Riley. In order to help the black-footed ferrets, we're actually promoting black-tailed prairie dogs. And definitely some creatures are easier to love than others. And prairie dogs and coyotes are always lower on everyone's list, it seems like but we still manage them appropriately or let them just be. And that's the way we try to manage the, the whole ranch is not by just aiming at one target species that we want to help, but to manage it holistically. Riley makes an important point here. It's not just about one species, but about managing for the whole landscape. A theme we talked a lot about in the first episode of Working Wild You this season on Arctic grayling. And even if by working to recover one species like Arctic grayling or black-footed ferrets in this case, you end up really improving habitat for all wildlife. But even once you get ferrets released on the ground, the work's really just beginning. And we'll learn more about that after the break. 
If you're enjoying Working Wild U, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to Working Wild U wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Now back to the show. With fewer than 400 black-footed ferrets in the wild today, keeping track of them and keeping them healthy is mission critical for biologists like Jonathan Wrights at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Working Wild U producer Zach Altman hopped in his truck at the May Ranch where Jonathan manages the ferret reintroduction. So Jonathan, what are we doing right now? We're headed out to uh, try to find the most endangered mammal in North America. (laughs) Got four nights to try to find some ferrets out here on the May Ranch. We'll be uh, spotlighting some prairie dog colonies all night and hoping that uh, ferrets coming up to do some hunting or stretch their legs for a little bit. And this is no simple task. Ferrets don't come up above ground very often. They sleep up to 21 hours a day and they only come up once every three or four days. So you may be asking, well, how do you find an animal that's mostly always sleeping in a prairie dog burrow? Luck and patience. Stay up all night, drive around the colony, shining spotlights until you hopefully catch that distinct green eye shine. They've got these emerald green eyes that that just shine about as bright as anything out here. And you can see it from a a long distance off. You may pick them up a quarter mile out. it's, It's no mistaken one when you actually do see it. We're on on a prairie dog town. We're just gonna basically just wait till it's time to time to start. So wait for dark. Yeah. Enjoy the enjoy oh, the evening. Well, this is great. Yeah, great kickoff. Also, we're gonna see what the storm. That storm is starting to look kind of wicked. It is pretty gnarly. It's uh, it's got tendrils reaching out over there. You know, a little bit of rain is fine. If we get a lot of bit of rain, we may have to to call it off. And he's trotting. Bet he's happy about this light. Gives you a sense on the eye shine, though. Yeah, that was definitely. See how he was obvious. pretty well oblivious, even coming into the light. Like they just, it's like they just have no clue what that light really is. Yeah, it's just... it generally does not bother him. Well, first animal. You know, sorry. Oh, you're gonna put Thank you. your window up. I'm gonna. While the team continued their search for ferrets, Zach asked Jonathan how it's been partnering with the May family. Um, one of the coolest things about this project is it's it's really rare to have a landowner that, that just wants the ferrets. Um, Dallas just really wanted ferrets on the ground, and he recognized that, that prairie dogs are a part of the natural part of the system, and, and he has never really done anything to control them on his place and he was comfortable with even the populations growing a little bit bigger and that is uh, an anomaly that is not a normal thing and similar to the candidate conservation agreement with assurances or ccaa that landowners are participating in when it comes to arctic grayling there's a tool in place to give dallas and his neighbors peace of mind for reintroducing an endangered species to the ranch the ranch is under a safe harbor agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which basically means that the uh, landowners uh, are not really responsible if anything negative happens to the ferrets on the place. Also, it's a pretty cool deal where it, you know, the ferrets, as far as the Fish and Wildlife Service are concerned, ferrets don't exist once they go on the other side of the fence on the neighbor's ground, which is really good because to, to release ferrets and endangered species out on, on a ranch then could go on to other people's ranches. There's a lot of folks that don't want to have to deal with the implications of having endangered species on their property. With this, Under the Safe Harbor Agreement, uh, it's, a, it's really a non-issue. So neighboring landowners, they can go ahead and, and manage the prairie dogs as they, as they see fit on their property. As we mentioned earlier, there can be social and even economic challenges to supporting prairie dogs. But the view of prairie dogs as pests is kind of starting to change as we learn more about grassland ecosystems. Prairie dogs are a key stone species, creating habitat for many other native species. Burrowing owls and jackrabbits all make use of their abandoned burrows, and many grassland birds make use of the bare ground for nesting. 
And then, of course, prairie dogs are also a key food source for certain animals like black-footed ferrets, but also swift foxes and coyotes. So, love them or hate them or something in between, prairie dogs are central to prairie ecosystems, just as landowners are central to grassland conservation. After the break, we're headed to north central Montana, where Fort Belknap Indian Community is working to restore the native prairie on tribal lands. And the next generation is leading the way. We're in a new chapter of conservation. In the first chapter of conservation in this country, you had wilderness and then you had city. But today, more and more, we understand that there's this very important piece in the middle that we call the working landscape. That is Leslie Allison, CEO of the Western Landowners Alliance. These are the places that provide our food, our fiber. They provide the jobs that sustain the rural communities. These things are incredibly important and they're disappearing. And that's really our next challenge going forward. We have to think beyond protected wilderness. And you can't do that unless you're engaging the people in those landscapes, first and foremost in that solution. Led by the people on the ground, Western Landowners Alliance advances policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. What we're seeing in the West today is incredibly hopeful because you do see collaborations, working with partners, trying to realize this vision that's so important to us. I think many places in the rural West are actually leading the way on this. And so can you. Join us and learn more at westernlandowners.org. So we're back. And now we're going to go from the May Ranch in eastern Colorado up to northern Montana, right near the Canadian border, to visit the Fort Belknap Indian community, home of the Nakoda and the Ani Nations. The reservation encompasses over 600,000 acres, mostly of rolling plains. The main industry is agriculture, consisting of small cattle ranches, raising alfalfa hay for feed, and larger dryland farms. Our producer, Zach Altman, visited the Fort Belknap Indian community to learn more about their work to support black-footed ferrets. My name is Tevin Messerly, and uh, I'm the Fort Belknap wildlife biologist for Fort Belknap Fish and Game. So, how do you feel about the prairie? The prairie? Well, first, it's home. You know, I can't get that on my head. I just really like the open area. There's a lot, a lot of people I know from here, and they create opportunities, and it's really nice. And like many rural communities, creating opportunities is critical for keeping young people in the area. According to their five-year conservation plan, Fort Belknap Fish and Game is working with Ani Nakoda College to train and mentor the next generation of stewards and biologists. And Tevin is part of that next generation. He recently graduated from the college's new four-year natural resource program. He says he got the wildlife biologist job after a biology internship through the college and a wildlife tech position with Fish and Game. I'm just really grateful that they had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Probably the best decision ever made there. Really? You like it so far? It's pretty, pretty nice. Nice having, you know, the scenery and working with all these species out here. Kind of meet a lot of people that you never really would uh, talk to in your life. Being in the field seems a little bit more natural to me, I guess. So where are we standing right now? So this is Snake Butte, a uh, pretty important place to the people of uh, Fort Bound up here, which we have our ferrets, buffalo, and occasional swift fox. Pretty spiritual place, uh, according to the Ani and Nakota people. Has to do with some stories that are told by our, uh, the tribes down here. Fort Belknap Indian Community has been actively restoring native species for a long time. Back in the 1970s, bison were reintroduced to the 22,000 acre Snake Butte area, and the herds have steadily grown since. Fort Belknap Fish and Game has also been working for years to recover endangered swift foxes and black-footed ferrets, all in an effort to both restore the prairie ecosystem and to generate economic opportunity on the reservation. And one of Fort Belknap's key partners in restoring black-footed ferrets is the World Wildlife Fund. 
My name is Christy Bly. I am the Blackfooted Ferret Restoration Manager for the World Wildlife Fund Northern Great Plains Program. I used to call myself a prairie dog farmer because <laughs> we are growing Blackfooted Ferret habitat. I like to refer to prairie dogs as the chicken McNuggets of the prairie because everybody eats them. <laughs> the chicken McNugget of the prairie. It's no wonder the little bandits of the prairie like them so much. I may never look at another prairie dog the same. And Christy would know, right? She's been working with the tribes at Fort Belknap since 2013. The tribes of Fort Belknap long ago decided to reestablish a population of blackfooted ferrets to their homelands. We did three years of releases, and now there's a thriving population of ferrets. We're still trying to reach that 30 adult mark, um, but we're, we're getting there, about halfway there now. I think that Fort Belknap Indian community are just really strong leaders in prairie conservation and reintroductions and a great role model for other tribes that want to do the same. So what are you up to tonight? So we're doing spotlighting, kit surveys. We're here to uh, find how many kits are litters that are on this uh, bison pasture. Yeah, we're just hoping to see as many kits as we find or we can find for vaccines and plague management mitigation. Yeah, so just to recover the species. We just heard plague come up again. In our reporting for this episode, it was clear from talking with biologists that plague is a top threat to both prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets. Right, and ferrets, they're often described as a conservation-reliant species, meaning that without active human management, at this point, they would likely go extinct. Now, most of that management involves plague mitigation. Biologist Jonathan Wrights gave us an example of the lengths required to mitigate plague. Uh, there's a sylvatic plague vaccine. It's basically these uh, peanut butter ball baits. They're about the size of a marble, and they're dyed blue so that when a prairie dog consumes them, they actually dye the intestines of the prairie dog for a while, and then their feces will be blue. And so you can go out there and you can walk and see blue prairie dog turds out there, and so that shows that you had uptake of the, the plague vaccine. Okay, blue prairie dog turds, but there's actually more. Biologists will capture black-footed ferrets, sedate them, and vaccinate them directly for plague and canine distemper. That's part of Tevin's mission right now. ID where the ferrets are so that the team can capture them later. In short, Field season, well, it involves a lot of long nights. And when did you start the survey period? So it goes on for 10 nights straight, and then we have two more sessions after that. But those two sessions are trapping and vaccinating. Yeah. So for now, it's just spotlighting. So there's buffalo out here right now. Mm -hmm. There's swift foxes. Mm -hmm. There's black-footed ferrets. It looks to be really healthy prairie dog colonies. Yeah. This seems like a big swath of na native prairie. That's huge. It's pretty, this, this part's pretty healthy. During the night, when you're spotlighting, you'll see a lot more movement. There's salamanders, there's, there's frogs, there's badgers that come out here and there. Cool. Well, I'm excited for tonight. Yeah, I'm glad to have so, some more help out here. So as the sun set, Tevin and Zach were joined by the rest of the survey team for the night. Interns from the Ani Nakota College and Michael Kinsey. Michael was actually the tribal biologist, Tevin's current position, for several years. Now he works at Ani Nakota College. Wear many hats at the college, honestly. So I manage two National Science Foundation grants. Okay. Yeah, so Christy one mentioned. is our our water center, and then I also am um, a co-director of the Buffalo Center as well. And I teach. <laughs> that is a lot of hats. It's clear that Michael plays a key role in this work and in the community. After getting spotlights mounted to the trucks, the survey began. Zach hopped in with Michael and Sage, an intern at the college. I'm, in, I'm an intern for the 
for the Tataga program, that's the Buffalo program. And then for the for the Nitsuini, that's the water, the water program. This is my first time in a while. Last summer I was doing this too. I'm glad I get to come out here though. It's it's really fun. Just looking around for blackwood ferrets. <laughs> and by this point, we know the drill from May Ranch. Drive around a prairie dog colony in the dark, shine lights, and look for those green shiny eyes. Michael talked with Zach about all the restoration work being done around Fort Belknap. The Fort Belknap Fish and Wildlife Department works with us at the college, but like partners with World Wildlife Fund, Defenders of Wildlife, Little Dog Wildlife, the Smithsonian, and then we all collaborate together to try and bring these species back. Why, why is Fort Belknap doing all this work? I know you can't speak for the whole yeah. community, but like, what what's valuable to, to doing this? It's just the way we are in terms of native people. And the ecosystem should be whole. It should be the way it should have been. Or the way we we're brought up as native people plays a big role in our conservation. Um, like for me personally, I've, always had an interest in in science really and so I'm glad I could just do these types of things in my backyard really. Um, And as an outsider being welcome to participate in the surveys it was clear to Zach that this is about more than doing prairie conservation. Not only is the community recovering species that have historical and cultural importance for both the Ani and Nakoda tribes but they are doing it in a way that creates economic opportunities, jobs, internships, research grants, and tourism. And with the conservation-reliant species like black-footed ferrets, you need people like Tevin and Michael and Sage and so many others out on the land doing the work. According to Christy Bly at World Wildlife Fund, that's the ideal scenario. Outside partners can be a great resource for funding and sharing of what we know about the biology of some of these things, but really the day-to-day operations need to be owned and led from within the tribes. And this is a great partnership that enables that to happen. Christy is making a really important point here. We're talking about locally led community conservation. And while outside partners are important, success is built on that local knowledge, management experience, and passion. And it shows that there is opportunity for students that enroll at Ani Dakota College. There are jobs for when they come out. You know, there are opportunities. And we hope to create many, many, many more of those over the years. And really, as partners become obsolete, because they'll be thriving with so many people and partners, you know, and funding coming down the pipe on their own. And I think really what we had been missing, and this is a lot of learning on my part too, is I was trained as a biologist, a wildlife biologist, so I knew biology. What was really missing were the social and financial pieces, were the community and the financial pieces to that formula. So now we have those three pieces of that formula in place, biological plus social plus financial, and we are seeing the dividends coming out of that. Christy really gets at the heart of what Working Wild U is all about. Stories focused on the challenges and successes of sharing and managing working lands with wildlife. From the May Ranch in eastern Colorado to Fort Belknap Indian Community in northern Montana. And in both places, for the people on the ground, this is about more than single species conservation. Both start with species centered at the crossroads of cultural knowledge and science in their own right, but that quickly grows to a story that really speaks to the heart of the American West. One that involves community, economics, landscape ecology, species recovery, people, and working lands conservation. You can also hear this in Michael's response when he talks about his love for science and his drive to see ecosystems whole again. Speaking towards that, back at the spotlighting survey, in the middle of the night, Michael, Sage, and Zach finally see something interesting. Right there. Sweet, that's a ferret. Cool. Heck yeah. The elusive ferret. Finally found one, that's exciting.
Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance, with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation and you, our listeners. This episode was written and produced by me, Zach Altman, with support from our hosts, Jared Beaver and Hallie Mahald. Lewis Wirtz and Jared Beaver are our executive producers. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Tevin Messerly at Fort Belknap Fish and Wildlife, Michael Kinsey at Ani Nakota College, Christy Bly at World Wildlife Fund, Dallas and Riley May, and Jonathan Wrights at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And as always, please be sure to follow us on social media and head to our website to check out show notes and bonus content. That's at workingwild.us. And please help more people discover the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with a friend or neighbor. And remember, if you're ever on the Great Plains, make sure you pay attention because you might get to say, Sweet, that's a ferret. Cool. Heck yeah. That's all for now. We'll see you next time on Working Wild You.